you know, I, I just think that everything that everything that's done, everything that's done has a little bit of room for some innovation, you know what I mean? Or a little bit of room for some sort of change, you know, without changing the entire world. I don't want the Dory to become, you know, a, a, you know, a 12 meter racing yacht. It's going to be a Dory when it's done, but I'm going to go about it just a little bit differently. And, and, and I think the differences that I'm going to use serve my purposes and probably would serve numbers of people's purposes. So one of the things that I'm going to do as we get back on this story project right here, or as I get talking about it, is discussing the, I'm going to eat this at the same time, um, the way we went about it. Some of the things of the way we've gone about it already are quite a bit different because I'm building it on a set of molds, which really isn't usually done in a dory like this, whether it was a Banks dory or whether it's a Swampscott style dory. They were built on their own frames. The frames were cut from tree crooks and uh, they were very accurately cut and beveled and everything and they were made up really in kit form and put onto them. Um, onto large vessels broken down so that when dories were lost at sea or whatever it might be, they could assemble another dory on the deck of a boat. So the planking was all cut out to shape and everything else and, and it's taken people quite a number of years actually to come up with all of those different shapes, all of the different shapes of the frames, of the planking and everything else, of the stem. The stems were pre-bent. The transoms were pre-cut, all kinds of different things were done. And that was all to facilitate being able to easily put a boat like this together on the deck of a boat. Now, I think it's wonderful, but on the other hand, I've always thought that it had a few problems. And uh, some of it really is in the nature of the material. I mean, you know, if you take one thickness of material and you have trouble with it afterwards, say it cracks or it checks or something, I mean, it can let the whole boat down. And uh, I think one of the most vulnerable parts in a boat like this really is the bottom of a boat like this because the bottom has to re uh, is required to hold the side plank and against the bottom and it's fastened together. And, and believe me, a lot of things like that have failed over the years and I think that you would, you would quickly know if you talk to people that own these types of boats over the last hundred years that numbers of different kinds of failures have happened. Now, I don't suppose I can get around every failure, every single solitary failure, but I'm certainly going to improve on it a lot. And one of the reasons is because of modern materials. Modern materials has helped all kinds of things out, different kinds of glues, different kinds of fabrics, all kinds of different coatings and paintings and fastenings and all kinds of stuff. So I've got a lot of, uh, of area to choose from in order to, to satisfy what I'm trying to satisfy. I want a bottom that will not fail and I also want a bottom that doesn't have any frames across the bottom inside the boat because I want the boat to be very easily bailed out. These boats were actually also designed to be used on beaches. When you swamp a boat like this, you can actually get underneath the boat and push up on it. You know, and then you, you, you break one gunnel above the water and push it up in the air from one gunnel and shove it up in the air and actually flip it over in the air and it lands on the water dry, empty, right? But you can't have gunnel caps if you're going to do that because if you have gunnel caps, the water doesn't want to run out. So there's all kinds of things in the designs of the boat that I'm taking into consideration that's going to satisfy what I want to have happen in a boat like this. One of the things that we've got going on here that I've wanted to show you for quite some time and people have been asking me about is the stem of the boat here. Now I suppose there's numbers of ways I could have gone about installing a stem in this boat here. Quite a few options really. I mean I could have sawn this out of a curved branch or out of the root of a tree or I could have laminated it with epoxy and uh, all kinds of different wood, whether it was mahogany or oak or some such thing, but I had to make a decision and I think the decision that satisfied me the most was to bend a nice raw piece of white oak and make a stem out of it that way. And that's what I've done. This is the first successful piece that I've done right here, but I do want to show you the first piece that I tried. Now this is the piece that you saw me uh, steaming 
in one of the last videos. And you know, it seemed like it was working out all right, but when I was done, I noticed that it opened up on the grain quite a bit. It has this squiggly grain in it here. It was probably awful close to a knot right in this area right here. And maybe that movement in the tree separates the, you know, the, uh, the grain and, and allows it to separate like when something like this happens. I mean, you can see that the amount of bend I put in it, look at the amount of curvature that I put into it right here. So it's a, you know, it was not a success whatsoever, but you know, it almost just made me laugh really because all I needed to do is just do it again and I knew that. So I picked a better piece of lumber for the second time around. And uh, I did a few different things. I generated a little bit more steam the second time out. I got it a little bit hotter as I bent it, and I probably was a little bit more patient, but basically it was exactly the same procedure. And we've come up with our first successful piece right here. And uh, like I said, it's the second attempt, but it hasn't bothered me, and I don't think it's bothered anybody else. I'm perfectly happy with the outcome of it. It's exactly what I wanted. Look at it. It's beautiful. You know, I'm going to just remove it so you can see it right here. Look at that. I mean, it's maintained its own shape. You know, this was a perfectly straight piece of lumber before I started with the steaming process. And this is exactly the shape I wanted. I bent it slightly over this, but not by much. And uh, what I've done then, once I got it bent into shape, I've sawn a slot in my false bottom here, and I've also sawn a slot in this piece of the, of the jig right here in order to insert the stem into that position. Now I'm just going to push it up into position right here and I've got a little wedge here just to wedge it up into, into shape right there and uh, basically just like that. Now let's just check some of the bevels here. I dubbed a bevel on it very, very quickly with an electric plane and I didn't expect it to be perfectly accurate, but uh, one thing I was trying to do was make sure I didn't dub past the center line that I put on it right here, because that's my ultimate goal is to get to the center line and have the right bevel over in here. It needs a little bit more material taken off right in here and uh, it's a little bit less than I need to do with an electric plane. So I've got a little block plane right here that will take care of it very easily. The block plane is the right tool for me because it's easy to handle. There really is no reason to have a big long plane when you're going around a curvature like this because the whole plane's not going to lay on there anyhow. So the block plane works really, really well. I've actually got three of them here that I'm working with. The thing that you really want to make sure you do here is to keep checking the bevel because the last thing in the world you'd want to do would be to plane off too much material. Then you'd find yourself in trouble. There's just no way around it. So what you want to do is keep checking until you've got the right amount of material taken off and not check after you've got too much material taken off. It won't do you any good. So I check it and plane it and check it and plane it until it comes out right. All right, let me check that. A little bit more off the inside, right in here. And I've got like three different planes I can use, so I'm going to use this one right now. Try that. Oh, nice. I'm using my pencil here to keep track of the center line that I had already previously put on before. Now I just got to darken it up and I don't want to sneak up on it too much as I plane it because I don't want to wipe it out. So I'm darkening it up a little bit and now I'm going to start planing actually on the other side. Now I'm using the same techniques really except for I plane from right to left no matter which way I'm doing it usually. You can see on the, on the uh, starboard side which is really kind of like on the port here that I'm planing downhill and on the other side I'm planing uphill. It's the only way my arms seem to work so You'll notice that the medullary rays are starting to pop right out here and uh, I love it because that's the way I pick the lumber out. I, I like to see that happen.
actually you're working with the feel of the plane too because you're not just uh, planing things off, you're using the plane under your hands to feel the surface of the material. So you can feel if you've got lumps or you've got places that haven't been planed or you can feel if the plane tips and tilts as it travels along, if it's changing bevel as it goes or if it stays at the same continuous bevel. There's all kinds of ways that you go about this. That's really all I need to do in order to plank it, to start planking it right there, to get that approach going right, and that looks pretty good. Now I'm checking that center line, and uh, I think that's just as good as it's got to be before I start putting planks on it. Once I get a couple planks on it, I'll have to do a little bit more dubbing up in this area up in here, but that's a little bit later on. The next thing for us to do here really is to prepare the next layer of bottom planking. Now I've picked out some nice material from around the shop, some shorter pieces, but it's all great stuff, nice and quarter sawn. And what I want to do, the first thing to it is to join it on the joiner so that I can get it all to clamp up against each other when I glue it off to each other. So you want to make sure that you hold the ends really nice and tight down against the surface of the joiner all the way through from one end to the other. Now that I've got one edge straight on each one of these pieces on the joiner, I'm going to move over to the table saw because that's the easiest way to get to the other edge and get it nice and parallel to the first edge. So I'll run each piece through the table saw quick and easy just like that and now I'm going to move over and resaw them on my bandsaw. I've set up a little fence here on my bandsaw and I've got it snuck up to the blade pretty close here. It's about 7 16 of an inch away from the blade. I got it clamped down nice and solid and uh, it works pretty good. I don't really want a big long fence. What I want is one that stands up nice and parallel to the blade for ripping. You notice when I'm ripping here that you don't see an awful lot of dust flying around because I've got this vacuum system working fantastic. And I'm really happy about that because otherwise I'd have dust flying everywhere. This is a real dusty process really here. The last thing for us to do here is to just run them through the planer. If you just put it in there and it just sucks it right through. They were 7 16 when we put them in the door and they come out 3 8 of an inch, you know. It just happens real easily and uh, they're nice and consistent, smooth on both sides. We've got them all prepped up. We're all ready to put them together. Now I'm removing that first layer of bottom planking and just setting it aside because I just don't have any use for it right now. Now I'm going to dust off the surface and cover the entire surface with packaging tape. It's just too easy. I don't have to know exactly where each piece goes or anything. I'm going to cover the whole surface. That way when I do glue these next pieces together on top of that surface, there's no way in the world I'm going to get them glued down on there. That wouldn't do me any good at all. I want them to be able to slide right off once they're finally glued together. Then I'll clean them all up and I can rip the packaging tape right off there just like nothing and have away with it. I'm doing a quick dry fit of these pieces before I assume they're going to fit perfectly. I'm going to weight them down with a few weights and put three or four clamps across them and just firm them up a little bit and just make sure they're going to fit up against each other perfectly before I start gluing. We've removed our second layer of bottom planking from the boat at this point. We had fit it together up there just to see how well it would work out and it's worked out great. So basically all we have to do at this point is glue the edges of the seams together and we've got it isolated from the first layer that on the boat because we don't want to glue the layers together yet. All we're trying to do at this point is to edge glue these four pieces together. We're going to use total boat two to one high performance epoxy glue and uh, let's get started. I'm going to pour the hardener first right up to that first increment right in the center of our pot right there. Now I don't know how many ounces or anything that is but that's one measurement right there. Let's just take a peek here. It looks good. Then I'm going to take our total boat resin and fill it up to the third increment. Now that's two to one mix right there. It's always the same with me mixing glue. I take my time mixing because I want to make sure it's mixed up really, really well. I don't want to skip any around the edges and I found that the more you mix it, the better it seems to go off. I've never had any failures as long as I've mixed away for quite some time and uh, I'm patient here. The glue goes off slowly so I've got plenty of time 
And uh, the other thing I'm going to do is once I've got it mixed up, I'm going to add a little bit of thickening agent into it because I want the glue to be a little bit easier for me to handle. I don't want it to run a lot and uh, I just have to handle it. I want to get it on the edges of my pieces only and uh, that just helps me out a little bit. I'm over at my bench here and there's nothing sophisticated about this setup. I've just got a couple of sleepers across it so that I can lay the pieces down against it and reach my hands underneath it and grab it by the opposite edge. Now I've got a chip brush, a two inch chip brush, and I've cut the bristles off about half the length just so that they be a lot stiffer. It makes it a lot easier for me to apply the glue to the edges of the pieces. So I hold them on the bottom edge and I just take the chip brush and just brush it down to the edge and I can brush it a couple of times on there or go back and forth or do whatever I want to spread it on there to make sure I've got enough on there. Now that I've got enough glue applied to that first piece, I'll just bring the piece over and set it down on the boat. Now I do like applying it up here on the bench like this because I just don't have the opportunity to get it all over me or all over the boat or anything like that. You know, I'm working with the one piece that I'm applying the glue to and uh, it's working out really well. The brush moves it back and forth really easily. Now the next couple pieces I'm going to glue on both edges and bring them over to the boat and set them down. And the last piece is just that one last edge. Once I get that one done, I'll bring it over, lay it down alongside the other pieces, and I'm ready to clamp them together. I'm going to add some spreader bars, especially down at each end with some lead weights on top of them, just to help coordinate the pieces. Now, once I've got that accomplished, I can start adding the bar clamps. Now, I'm going to add about 10 real lightweight bar clamps, but I'm going to be kind of patient about how I tighten them up. I want to just make sure that the pieces are nice and even with each other. I can coordinate the pieces while they're still loose. Once I've got them all coordinated the way I want to have it, I'll just tighten the bar clamps up a little tiny bit and I can just walk away and let it harden. 